Hi, I'm Bill Nudera, and welcome to my channel dedicated to clinical endodontics. If this is your first time here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click that little bell icon so you get instant notifications every time I post a new video. If you're already subscribing, welcome back. This patient was referred to me for treatment of tooth number nine. It was given a diagnosis of previous root canal treatment and asymptomatic apical periodontitis. Let's look at the PA. The PA shows tooth number nine with a full coverage restoration, post core, and prior incomplete root canal treatment. A lesion has developed. Patients unaware of how long that root canal was done, but they just claim it was done many, many years ago. I've got the cone beam scan open. We can see all three planes visible here. Looking at our coronal, we see very similar information to what we had on our two-dimensional projection PA. Looking at the sagittal, we see the area of low density. We see a break in the cortical plate. Moving to the axial, continuing to advance apically. We see here in the apical third, one root with one untreated root canal system. As we advance beyond the apex, we can see that area of low density. I also see a little bit of expansion here of the buccal plate. The patient is currently asymptomatic, but is concerned about the future prognosis of this tooth with that radiolucent area present. Whenever we evaluate teeth that have been previously treated, we've got to understand what the etiological factors are. In this particular situation, to me, it's pretty clear that the etiology is coming from internal contamination, which is causing uh, either non-healing or recurrent infection in the apical area. Based on the primary etiology being internal, we now have to decide what our reasonable treatment options are for a case like this. Certainly option one is no treatment. A lot of times patients associate pain with the need for treatment. So when there is no pain, the patients automatically think there may be no need for treatment. Although that's not our recommendation here, patients always have the right to choose no treatment. The other option we have here is a full retreatment, which would include full disassembly, removal of that full coverage restoration, removal of that post, retreatment of that root canal system. Now, this is a legitimate option moving forward. The advantage to taking an approach like this is we'd be removing the obturation material, redisinfecting, and reapplying a seal with arguably a pretty predictable success rate. But the disadvantages to moving in that direction are pretty significant. That's a pretty large post. And in order to remove that post, we risk root damage. Plus, we're dealing with a very aesthetic restoration here. Restorations that were done in the entire anterior area, and they all look pretty good, and they all match. So by going in there and disassembling and removing this one tooth, getting an aesthetic match a second time around may not be as favorable as we think it would be. Option three, surgical root canal treatment. There are a lot of advantages to considering a surgical intervention here. We would be able to maintain the current restoration. We would be able to minimize any sort of damage from a disassembly process. There would be minimal aesthetic concerns, presuming that we can design a flap that prevents any sort of gingival issues. Option four, extraction and tooth replacement. This patient was not interested in having this tooth removed. And after discussing all the options with the patient, we decided that a surgical approach would be the most conservative option moving forward at this time. Before creating a flap, I always like to bone sound. I want to have a good idea of where that alveolar crest is because it helps me design that flap. In this particular situation, since we're dealing with some aesthetics, I'm going to want to consider a submarginal flap, but we need to make sure the supporting bone underneath can support that submarginal flap. There's about a three millimeter probing depth here, which tells me that if I can make an incision about five millimeters apical to that gingival crest, then I can keep the incision line within alveolar bone, and it's a good candidate for a submarginal incision. This is the flap design that I came up with. It's 
typical for me to have the patient bite on a four by four gauze on the opposite side of where the surgical field is going to be. And I typically will pack the vestibules with some two by two gauze to pick up any heme that may fall back in that area during the process. Prior to making the incision, I will typically take a periodontal probe and I'll try to outline or mark on the gingival tissues the terminal position of that incision line. And then once I have those areas marked, it's a connect the dots situation. I then follow and scallop my incision around. That helps me ensure that I'm going to stay within the bounds of that alveolar bone underneath based on the prior probing depths that I established. The flap is then reflected so that we can expose the surgical field and the area around the apex of tooth number nine. We can see that little mild swelling occurring. An initial osteotomy is placed through that thin bone and a portion of the tissue is removed and sent for biopsy. I generally send all tissue samples for histological biopsy just to make sure that it is what I think it is. Following removal of the initial tissue and exposure of the root, I will then section off three millimeters of that apical segment of that root. Looking at the remaining root structure here, we can see that obturation material in that root canal system is really contaminated. This is a bit of a concern because we're not retreating the internal root canal system when we know that that's where that etiological factor is coming from. So taking this approach, it's going to have some risks. And the risks are that leakage can still occur despite our best efforts to prevent it from occurring. But I still think that it's the best choice in this scenario based on the other risks of the disassembly and the post removal. So moving forward, we prepare this area with ultrasonics and we remove as much of that material as we can. Once that canal system is as clean as we can get it with our ultrasonics, we then seal off that apical area with a bioceramic material. In this particular situation, I chose to use a bioceramic putty-like material because it was easier for me to handle. I'll typically graft all of my sites. I'll use a little bit of DFDBA and I place a membrane over there to protect it. This, the tissue is then repositioned, and I was able to close this with just interrupted suture technique. This is the post-op PA. We can see the graft placement. We see the resected root, as well as the root end restoration. Patient returned about 10 days later for suture removal, and this is what the tissue looks like. I'm pretty happy with how this looks 10 days out. We can see after the sutures have been removed, we're going to get a really nice result with this case. The patient had minimal swelling, minimal discomfort following this procedure because the tissue was managed well. I generally like to have the patient back after suture removal one month, three months, six months, and one year. But due to the location where this patient lives, it's not feasible for this patient to travel back to see me for these short-term follow-ups. So based on the way the tissue looks here at the suture removal, I feel comfortable having this patient back at a six month interval, which is the next time they're gonna be in the area for me to do a follow-up. So stay tuned. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of mine today. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'm Bill Nudera, thanks for watching.